Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we go back to the year 980 AD when the king's reign began to decline. As Viscounts, you'll be constructing buildings, writing manuscripts, working in the castle and acquiring deeds for new land. Viscounts of the West Kingdom is for 1 to 4 players, takes 60 to 90 minutes to play, for ages 12 and up and published by Renegade Game Studios here in North America. Today we'll be doing a rule school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rulebook yourself. I've placed timestamps below me in the description of this video just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Without further ado, let's get started. Viscounts of the West Kingdom is a strategy game for one to four players where you're trying to amass the most points in the end. You're going to be managing a hand of cards, playing them on your board, which will give you certain abilities and giving you power to certain actions you'll take throughout your turns. You'll be moving your Viscount around a rondelle and then taking certain actions at those spots like trading for resources or spending resources to build buildings, giving you effects and points at the end of the game. You might be placing workers, causing a chain reaction, allowing your workers to move forward to the castle, getting you more points. You might be transcribing manuscripts, giving you extra bonuses if you're the first to collect certain sets, or if you have multiples of different ones, you'll get big points in the end. And even though having criminals can help you by giving you wild icons, they can cause you to gain corruption, which can cause bad things to happen for you. And you'll also be using town folks for certain abilities and adding these to your hands to give you more long-term strategy. So it combines hand management, resource management, action selection, rondelle movement, and set collection. To set up, you're gonna find the five individual sections of the board and you're gonna put them together in a circle like this. But you want to pay attention to the player counts on the inside portion of those boards because you want to make sure that you're using the right side of the board for your player count. For example, we're playing a four player game here today and this one says three plus, the back side of this one says one to two. So you want to make sure each one of them look at both sides, make sure you have the right player counts for all five sections. It does not matter which order they are, they're randomized every game. Next, you'll place the castle and you'll sort of set it in so it locks in. Each of these little round castle spots goes into the round section of the board, so it's all locked in there. Now, these are inset with pieces that you have punched out from the cardboard when you first got the game. The orientation of this is random each game as well. Next, you're going to locate all the neutral townsfolk cards, and you'll know they're them because the banner where their name is is all black. And you're going to take all of those and separate them out so that there are five relatively equal piles all face up. And you'll notice each section of the board has a spot to put those notated by the card borders. So it might look something like this. Also, please note that normally you'll place the top of the card towards the outer edge of the board, but these ones I've flipped the other way just to make it easy on the camera for you. Next, you're gonna locate all the manuscripts. They look like this on the front side and the back side are most of them are black, but there's five of them that are gray. And you'll take those five gray backed manuscripts and place them face down in a row like this. You'll then randomly take six of those black backed manuscripts and place them on top of each of those five gray backed ones. So you have five piles of a total of seven manuscripts in each pile. In each section of the board, you'll see a spot to place those manuscripts face up. So when you flip your stacks face up and place them on there, it will look like this. And even though the manuscripts and the town folks cards are face up in a stack, you're not permitted to look through any of those stacks. Off to the side, you're going to place all these resources. You have silver, you have the stone, ink wells, gold, and you're going to place some cards there too. There's some double-sided resource multipliers. You have the castle leader card, and you have four of the cleric bonus cards. You'll place these off to the side as well. Each player is going to get a player board. It doesn't matter which one you get, but it does matter which way is face up. Uh, the easiest way to tell is that these three spots that have spots that you'll place cards don't have any banners on them. The opposite side is for the solo game, which is outside the scope of this video, has two brown banners. You don't want that side. What you want is the side that does not have those banners in it. On that board, you're going to place all your buildings of the color that you've selected to play for this game. Now, the three buildings, you can tell which ones go where because on the board, it actually has the depiction of what those buildings look like. There's three of each. We have the trading posts, the guild halls, and the workshops. You're also going to take this black marker. It's corruption. It will go here, and the white virtue marker will go there. And for now, you'll just place your Viscount off to the side like that. And off to the side, you can also place your 20 workers as well. 
Each player will find their eight starting town folk cards, and the banner will be the same color as the player color they're playing. Just put them face up in a stack just to the left of your board for now. You'll then randomly assign the star player, and you can give them this token. Next, you're going to find the player cards that look like this on one side. You're going to shuffle the deck of those and place the number of cards out equal to the number of players plus one. You're also going to do the same thing for these hero cards, and they look similar to the townsfolk cards, except these ones have brown banners where the names are. Again, deal one out below each of these. The rest of the player cards and hero cards that aren't placed here can be placed back in the box. You won't need them this game. Now, starting with the last player in turn order, which is the one sitting just to the right of the start player and going counterclockwise, meaning the start player is going to have the last choice, they're going to select one pair of cards, and a pair of cards is a player card from the top and a hero card from the bottom. Now, when a player does that, they're going to look at the number in the top part of the player card. They're going to find that numbered spot on the board, and they're going to place their Viscount there, facing in the direction of the arrow. Then that player is going to take all the resources that are on the card, and then they might get some cards as well. We haven't yet talked about these red or black cards. We're going to do more setup for these later, but for now, just place them in separate piles. Uh, the black cards are debts. Make sure they're all face like this, where it has two of these score markers with the lines through them. You don't want to see that side. You want them to be like this, the whole entire pile. And for the red deeds pile, you want them to be so they have that one scoring marker there. So in this case, this player would get one of the red deed cards and three of the debt cards and keep them facing the same way they are. Unless you're a player that gets something like this where it says to flip the, that, in this case, that one black deck card, they'll flip it over. Now there's a lot of icons in this. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but the back of the rule book has a quick reference for pretty much most of all the effects in the game. So we're not gonna go over all these now. Some of them will go over as we teach the game. So at this point, you might not be sure exactly which of these cards you want if it's your first time playing, and that's okay. You can either wait till you watch the rest of the video, then come back to this spot, or just pick one that looks good with the uh, hero card that you like. And so each player is going to consecutively take a pair of cards. And when a player takes a pair of those cards, after they've done everything on the card, they'll put this card in the upper left part of their board and just flip it over. This is going to be a player aid for them. Their hero, they're going to take, and they're going to shuffle it in with all of their starting townsfolk cards. And after shuffle, they'll place them face down just to the left of their board as a draw deck. Then they'll draw the top three cards from that draw deck and place it in their hands. They can see these cards, but they don't want anybody else to. And once all players have selected a pair of cards, there'll be one left. You can discard them out of the game. Now, earlier we told you we we're going to finish setting up the debt and deeds cards. Now's the time to do that. First, you're going to find this poverty card and this prosperity card. Now, you're going to look at for the amount of players. In this case, we're playing with four. We would take 18 of these black debt cards and we would place them right on top of this. So at this point, it will look like this. Then you're going to take the rest of these and you're going to place it underneath that poverty card. So it should look something like this. You'll do the same thing for the prosperity card and the deed cards. And so it should look like this when you're done with those two. We'll talk more about how these cards work later. Now these black back card and the corresponding reference card can be placed back in the box. These are only for the solo game and that's outside the scope of this video. The object of the game is to have the most points in the end, and all points are scored at the end of the game. You'll be scoring points by building different amounts of these different sets of buildings. And by having workers in the castle, the closer they are to the middle, the more points they'll be worth for you. By transcribing manuscripts and having these banners be different colors and having sets of different colored manuscripts. Or getting a cleric bonus by being the first to transcribe three manuscripts of the same color. And you'll also be getting points by getting deed cards, getting even more points if you're able to flip them over, but you'll be losing points if you get debt cards and you aren't able to flip those over. The game is played over multiple rounds. Each round, a player will take a turn starting with the start player and going clockwise. And on your turn, each player is going to go through six different phases. The first phase of your turn is called card management. And what you're going to do here, on your first turn, you're going to have three spots here that are open. And you'll select one of the three cards that are in your hand that you started with, and you'll place it in the furthest left spot like this. Now what you're doing by this is having icons in the left side of the card. Now you'll also notice that the two other spots on your board also have icons. This is allowing you in your first turn to be able to use these different icons that you'll use in a future phase to activate one of the four different actions and each of these icon types have to do with the different actions that you can take because you'll be taking one of these four in a future phase of your turn. However, on subsequent turns, at the beginning of this card management phase, you're going to take all your cards here, you're going to slide them to the right, opening up a spot for you to play another card. So for example, 
you can place this one at this point. Keeping in mind that at the bottom of these have different times that abilities might trigger. If it has a lightning bolt, it will trigger immediately like right now. So this is gonna gain you two silver and it's going to allow you to discard a card. And also I'm not gonna go over all the icons as we see them in the game. Remember that all these are on the back of the book. Like this one here tells you exactly when and how to use that. Other cards might have this icon in it. This means it's a continuous ability that's always active as long as this is on the board. And in this case, this just basically says anytime you take the trade action, you'll gain a silver. We'll talk about this trade action a little bit later. Now, this is how your board looked at the beginning of this phase. Remember, you slide everything to the right. And when this slides off, it goes to a discard pile right there. And notice that some of the cards might have an X down here. And this means this will trigger any time that a card goes off to your discard pile here. This is known as a drop off effect. And in this case, you'd be able to flip one of those debt or uh, deed cards that we showed you earlier in setup. But again, all of them would slide and then you would pick one to go here. Now it is possible for you to only have three cards. And if that's the case, when this one drops off, it would get sort of shuffled, put on the top of your deck and it would come out just like this. And for that reason, you can never have less than three cards. Now, it is possible that you might not have any cards in your hand, and at this point you take the top card off your deck and you randomly place it here. Now, if when placing a card here, you see this icon. That is the icon of a criminal. You will immediately gain corruption for each of these icons on your board. So in this case, we would only go once. But if it looked like this and you just played this, there's one here, there's one here, you would actually gain two corruption. So let's talk about gaining corruption. Now for each corruption you gain, you move this to the right. So if you gain one, it would go here. If you, if before we had two, you would gain it like this. Now, if you ever gain virtue in the game, and that's an icon that will look like this on cards and things, uh, it'll go left once for each. Now over the course of the game, these are gonna be moving into each other. And at some point they may collide like this. We'll talk more about colliding later, but if they're on top like this, let's say you get one more corrupt corruption, it will take this token with it. Just like if you get virtue, it'll take this token with it. And if you're ever all the way to the right and you gain corruption, it would just stay there. If you're all the way to the left and you gain virtue, it would also just stay there. We'll talk about this collision a little bit later in a later phase, but also note, just generally speaking, this is going to help you get uh, deeds and debt cards and other things will happen too that we'll talk about later. So after you've done your card management phase, and again, that corruption is reminded here. If you place a criminal, you get one corruption for each of these. After that, you go to this phase, which is the movement phase. You're going to be moving your Viscount, which is on the board and it will look just like this. Now about this movement is it's going to depend on the card that you've just played. You got to look at the silver and there's going to be a value number. Here's one. This was three last turn and this was one two turns ago. So in this case, we have one. Now here's my Viscount, and I have to move one. I can never move less than the silver amount that I just played on that player. And I have to move in the direction of these arrows. And so this is going to go up this way or down this way. If you look here, this was coming this way because you're always going clockwise on this board. So I can either move one up this way or one down this way. Let's say we move one and we go like this. Now remember, you can never move less than the number that you had just played on the silver on the card in the previous phase. However, if I wanted to move further, I could spend one silver for every spot that I would want to go further. So if I didn't want to stay here and end my movement here, I could have spent one silver and for every one, I will move on the board following the arrows as I showed previously. However, let's just decide to stay here. And if you do, if you ever finish your movement on a same spot of another Viscount, on your player reference card at the top, it actually shows if you ever do this, the other player can rearrange their cards on their board because it might they might want them in a specific order because things might be dropping off next turn and things like that. Now on your player reference card, you can actually see that if two Viscounts end in the same spot, the other player, the one that was that you moved into, gets to rearrange their cards, their townsfolk's cards on their board. And this might help them because they might want one to drop off before another one. Then you're going to the next phase, which is the primary actions phase, which you're going to select one of these four primary actions. But keep in mind, as I show you this, depending on where your Viscount is, you really only have certain options. For example, let's look at the trade action here. Now, first, we're going to look at all the trade icons on our board. Right now, we have one here, we have one here, and we talked about criminals earlier, but I did not yet mention that these are a wild symbol. Even though they gain you corruption, the good part is they're wild. So essentially, I have three trade symbols here already. Now, you can only trade when your Viscount's on the outside of the board like we are here. 
So if we are here, we can use two of those trade icons to gain a stone and all the resources just get held you know, next to your board. But you'd need two to do that. If you remember, we had three icons. So if we want to do this again, you can see in this icon, not only does it have the trade icon, it has silver. That means you can spend silver to count as a trade icon. So we had two trade icons and a criminal, so essentially three trade icons because the criminal's wild. We spent two to get a stone, we had one more on our board, we would spend one more silver, that would get us two more, and we can get another stone. So on these spots, you can use these exchanges as many times as you want as long as you have the resources to do so. And don't forget to look at some of your ongoing abilities, like this one. Anytime we took the trade action, we would have gotten an additional silver because of our trader on our board. Now you'll notice this icon in the primary action slot, and that actually matches up with a little spot on the townsfolk cards out on the board. Let me show you. On the top right of the card, adjacent to the spot that we are, it has that icon in the upper right. And that means that in addition to your primary action and spending, in this case we were spending an additional silver to do trade, uh, you can also dismiss this townsfolk to gain extra icons. Now a couple things about this, you can only dismiss one townsfolk per turn, and you must pay the silver, and it must have an icon equal to the action that you're taking. Now in this case it would either have need needed to have been the trade icon, or since criminals are wild, this is okay. So we could have spent one silver to dismiss this townsfolk because the criminal icon is wild. And by doing that, spending the silver and dismissing, you're going to get to use the icon uh, that's on the left side. In this case, it's the criminal icon, so we're getting an additional trade uh, icon here. Now, you will be discarding this card, but you will do the effect that's under that icon in the upper right. In this case, it's discarding that card from your hand to your draw pile. So by dismissing, you'll place this in the discard pile, and a new one comes out. Remember, you can only dismiss one townsfolk per turn. Now keep in mind, in this primary action phase, you're only going to be doing one of these, and as you saw, the primary action of the trade could only be done on the outside of the board. You would normally go to your next phase after doing that, but I'm going to go over the other actions right now. So let's say our board actually looked like this and we wanted to take that build action. Now I pulled these buildings back a little bit just so you can see the icons a little better. To build a building, you'll need a certain amount of this hammer icon. You need three to build this building, seven for this, and five for this. Now we have one here, and we have the criminal, which is an, a wild. So we have two, but notice you can also spend stone. Before in the trade, you could spend silver. Here you can spend stone to increase this. So we have one, two, and let's say we just have some stone and we spend one, that'll give us a total of three. We could build any one of these buildings. Now you don't have to build these in order or anything. As long as you have the resource, you can build any one of the buildings that you want. And keep in mind, you can use as much stone as you want to increase that amount. So let's say we were gonna use three and we were gonna build this building here. Now that build action, number one, has to be done on the outside of the board. And there has to be an open spot on your, on, you know, adjacent to where you are like this. We see another player's building here. We also see a river here. This spot is to the right of the river, so this spot is adjacent to that. You could not build here because it's to the left of the river, so this would be built from this spot over here. But there is an open spot here, so we'll place it. We'll, we'll automatically get this effect immediately, which in this case is flipping a debt or a deed card. So we would place our building on it just like this. Now, if with this line it connects to another building, then the effect in between those both players get to do. And if you happen to own both of these buildings, you only do it once. Now we had just placed this building, but I've actually removed all of them because below them are different effects that I wanna go over. The first one has to do with the spot just below it, the Viscount, allows you to move an additional spot for free when you move. Uh, this one, when you're dismissing townsfolks, it always just costs you one. These next ones just give you additional icons that you'll count when you're taking actions in addition to the ones you have on your or townsfolk cards on your board. These essentially open up extra icons for you. Now these three have to do with phases we haven't talked about yet, so we'll talk about those later. And also remember, by building these buildings, you're going to get a certain amount of points depending on how many you've built in this section. If we built all three in this, we'd get nine points. If we had built two of the three, we'd get five. And if we built only one of them, we'd get two. That's how the points work for each of these sections. Again, points are always at the end of the game. Now instead of building, let's say we wanted to place workers. That's one of the other primary actions, and it's these icons along with any gold spent. Now when you do this, depending on how many icons you have or use, you'll be able to place a certain amount of workers. So one, three, five, or eight of these icons is equal to one, two, three, or four workers you'll place. Let's just say we do one. Let's say we're just using the criminal icon on our board. We didn't have any gold to spend your Viscount would have needed to have been in the spot closest to the castle. So let's just assume that's where we had moved to. Also keep in mind, 
You could dismiss this one for paying the two silver and you would have gained another one of those icons if you needed it. Now when adding workers, you're gonna add it to the closest spot to where your Viscount is. In this case, we were just adding one, so we will add one to this spot just like this. And at this point, you're gonna to check to see if you have three or more workers of your kind in that spot. In this case, we do because we have three of them. So we will immediately move one of them into the next closest spot right in front of it. And you'll immediately gain that effect. In this case, it's two virtue. Now I only removed those just to show you the icons. Uh, these would not move. They'd stay just like that for now. Then the other two, you'll notice that there's a left and right arrow. You move one to the left and one to the right. Now you check to see if you have three or more workers in any other of the first tier castles. And we do by moving this one over here, we have three. So we would do that same thing again, move one to the middle, do the effect and move one left to right. We would then check to see if there's any other first tiers with three of our workers and there are not. Now we look at the second tier. Are there any three workers in one section of all of ours? There is just like this. So one of these moves directly into the center. Now, anytime you do this, you get a resource of your choice denoted by the icon right there. Now these workers do not move to the left or the right. There's no arrows there. It only happens on the first tier. Now there's no other second tiers with three of ours, so we're done with those movements. Then we look at all the first and second tiers and see if there's more than three of workers of any colors. So four or more essentially. And we do in this first tier, we have four. And so we're gonna bump workers off until there's just three. So in this case, we're just gonna bump one off. We get to decide. So let's say we bump one of these yellow workers off. This is just given back to that player. It goes back into their supply. Now, if you bump a worker off a level one tier, they get two silver, the ones that were bumped. If it was off the second tier, they get a virtue and any uh, resource. And now's a good time to point out at the end of the game, if you're on the first, second, or third tier for each of your workers there, you're gonna get one, two, or three points for each of those respectively. Now I showed you an example of the castle pretty far into the game. However, whenever the first player gets their worker into the middle of the castle, they will take this castle leader card. If you have it at the end, it's worth five points. If somebody else gets more workers in the middle than you, they take this from you. So this can move from player to player. At the end of the game, if you have it, it's five points, but all the while that you have this, you have a continuous ability of having a hand limit of plus one. So usually at the beginning of the game, you have a hand limit of three, and now you're going to have a, you know, a fourth card while you have this specific castle leader card. So let's talk about the last of the four primary actions. Remember, you're only taking one of these during this phase. These two, you have to be on the outside of the board. These two, you have to be on the inside of the board. This one is transcribing a manuscript. You're gonna be using these icons on your board and possibly using the resources of inkwells to add to those icons. So remember, you have to be on the inside of the board because it's right near the manuscripts. Also keep in mind, you can dismiss for two silver. You could dismiss this one to get an extra icon. In this case, you need to have three of those icons to transcribe this manuscript. Now, in this case, it would, you would resolve this immediate effect, which is gaining a deed card, but you'd put it off to the side of your board. Now, these are gonna do different things. There's gonna be some end game scoring that we'll go over later. It has to do with getting sets of the uh, four different color of manuscripts. But also, if this was the third black that you've got, you would take this clerk bonus card if you were the first one to get three of those. And this is gonna be worth three points at the end of the game and you have a continuous ability to always give, going to give you another one of those icons for the rest of the game. And if the spot on the board does not have any actual manuscripts on it, you can still do this action, uh, but you don't take anything, but you do get this immediate action here, which is taking two resources of any type. Now, after taking one of these primary actions, I just showed you all of them, but you're only taking one, uh, you can, if you want to, recruit the townsfolk that's currently adjacent to your Viscount. So in this case, it would be this one. I would pay the silver if I wanted to recruit this card. If so, now remember, when we dismissed it, we did this action, but also it has the plus icon, which is the recruit icon. So if we do recruit this, we'd pay two silver. We would get this card and we would also get this immediate action, but you only get to do this once. You can't do it to multiples of them. Now that recruited townsfolk just goes into your discard pile, which is just off to the right of your board. Earlier we had built this building, so in this phase, uh, we can now take this, which is a discard. So we can discard a card from your hand or draw a pile because we've unlocked that spot. But of course, this is only activated when you do hire a townsfolk. The next phase is resolving a collision, and this is the only time in your turn that you actually will resolve if the virtue and the uh, corruption are locked on top of each other. The first thing that happens is all players that have built their second workshop, meaning this is uncovered during this phase, if any player that has unlocked this and has no criminals on their board, they gain one virtue. 
Now, theoretically, that could be us, but we do have a criminal on our board, so we wouldn't do it. Next, players might have abilities on townsfolks that happen when any player causes a collision. In this case, this player would get a gold. Then the player that caused the collision would get the effect above. So in this case, they'd get a deed card and a silver. All other players gain the items below where this happens. So all of the players with one or more criminal on their board is going to move their corruption one to the right. And once this is finished, then the player that caused the collision would move their corruption and virtue markers back to their starting spots. The next phase is drawing cards. They would draw cards from their deck to their hand limit. Remember, your hand limit starts at three. And remember that you may have other effects that increase your hand limit. And also, this does as well as we talked about earlier from the castle leader card as long as you have it. And speaking about this, if you do lose this card by somebody else, you don't have to go down to your hand limit. You only need to uh, you know, review your hand limit at this spot. Now, if at this spot you need to draw cards and there are not enough cards in your draw pile to do so, you then shuffle all the cards in your discard pile. And on the bottom of your player aid, it shows you at this point, if you have one or more criminals on your board, you would gain a corruption. If you have no criminals, you'd gain a virtue. Now, even if things collide at this point, it will not cause a collision. That only happens in this phase of your turn. And also note that in this phase, if you had built this building, that's another way to increase your hand limit. If you had both of these in this case, your hand limit would be increased by two. So once you shuffled those cards from your discard pile, you'd make a new draw deck over here and you'd draw up to your hand limit. Then it would be the next player's turn clockwise. So players will continue taking turns in clockwise order until one of two things happens. Either the debt pile or the deed pile has completely emptied so you see the poverty or prosperity card with no cards on top of it. At this point, you're going to finish that round so everyone has taken an equal amount of turns. And then there's one more full round and then the game will end. And this is the only time where scoring happens. Each player is going to get points for the buildings. Again, depending on how many you've built in each section, you'll get a certain amount of points. In this section, two of them are built, so they'll get nine. One of them are built here, they'll get six. All three are built here, they'll get nine. You'll get one point for each of your workers in the first tier, two points for each in the second tier, and three points for each in this third tier of the castle. And this is reminded of you on your player aid. Next, you're gonna score for your transcribed manuscripts. Now, you can get points from your cleric bonus cards. And this was because I was the first one to get three of the black barrel ones. This is worth three points. I also got three blues, but I wasn't the first to do it. So I did not get the blue bonus card for that. Then you're going to look at the sets that in how many of each set you have of different banner colors. There's four total. Uh, and you'll get a certain amount of points. In this case, I have four different, so I would get 16 points. Here I have three different, so I'd get nine points. And here I have two different, I'd get four points. This is shown on your player aid, and the easy way to remember is the amount that you have that are different multiply by itself. So four times four is 16, three times three is nine, and two times two is four. You'll also get five points if you have the castle leader card. Now, regardless of how the game ended, for each debt that was unflipped, you'll lose two points. Keeping in mind, if you're able to flip it during the game, you get immediate effect of any resource. But if you weren't able to flip it, it's minus two points. The deeds are going to get you one point, And if you're able to flip those, they'll each be worth three points. So you add and or subtract points depending on those cards, how many you have, and which way they are oriented. Now, in this case, the game ended because uh, the poverty card was shown because all of the debts were taken. And what this means is that everyone is going to look at their flipped deed cards. Even though the, the, the debt colors are black, these are red. So, and the one who has the most of those will get 12 points, second most, eight, third most, four. However, in a game with less than three players, the eight points is not given. It's just first place and third place is given. By the way, if it's a tie, like for first, you would add these two up and split it. So it'd be 20 divided by two. If two players tied for first place, each of them would get 10 points and the next player would get this. And of course, that's assuming that you're playing with three or more players. Now, if the game ended because the prosperity card was shown, then the players would look at their flip debt cards and they would score the same way. However, since you finish off the round and have one additional round, once one of these two cards is shown, it is possible that both of them will be shown at the end of the game. And in that case, you score both of them in the ways that I showed. Now, when one of these are empty, if you ever need to get more cards of that, you simply take one from underneath there. At this point, whoever has the most points is the winner. If it's tied, the players with the most remaining silver and resources is the winner. And if it's still tied, those tied players share the victory. Well, I hope this helps you dive right into Viscounts of the West Kingdom. Now, if you have further questions about the rules, I've placed a link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them since I'll be notified, but so will Renegade Game Studios.